Well, hi, stranger. It's Tuesday, and it's time for another true, original, scary story you won't find anywhere else. And this one is story number 46. I live in a good-sized town. I navigate the hustle and bustle by being very regimented in my day-to-day -day life. I mean, everyone is, to an extent, following some kind of routine. The trip to the coffee shop drive through to fit into the timing of getting to work or tending to hit the same grocery store on the way home you've been going to for years, even if new grocery stores have opened in the interim. But for most folks, this is very subconscious or unaware. Not me, though. I set my life to max efficiency on purpose. While I have reaped the benefits of good habits and reserved executive brain function, I'd be remiss if I didn't also cop to it bringing some trouble my way. In a vacuum, a regimented life is just smart. But life is not in a vacuum. Even in a town that has super warm communal vibes, like mine does, there's going to be some people who are paying attention to you for all the wrong reasons. And that's where I found myself. My routine go-to coffee shop was on my way to work. I was retail assistant manager at a shop that sold camping gear and hiking apparel. I always got the same thing at the coffee shop, mocha with extra chocolate. And by the time I got up to the counter, they'd usually have it made and waiting for me. One day, I took a phone call while I was in line. It was my boss. It was the last week before school started. Our shop had been slammed during the busy summer season, seeing to local families as well as tourists. My boss wanted to show his appreciation for his staff, bolstering our busy season to record sales. Thus, he was organizing a trip east of town for the whole crew. I hesitated. Getting thrown out of my daily routine stresses me out, which is likely the opposite of the point of the camping trip. But he was not having any of it. After all, he said, we sold the gear. Surely I could agree we needed to give a fair report on its quality to customers. What better way to do that than to try it out ourselves? What could I do? I agreed. I got off the call just in time to greet the cashier and pick up my coffee. I was distracted. Even as I was saying thank you, see you tomorrow to the guy at the register, my mind had moved on to buzzing about this new complication. I resolved to look ahead and plan a few things. The food I would bring, a schedule that got me up a full hour before everyone else, to give myself some time, alone with my thoughts. Just things that, hopefully, would help me deal with the upcoming anxiety. The next Monday, I swung by the coffee shop on my way out of town a bit earlier than normal. The cashier, a girl this time, noticed. She jokingly asked what I was doing there so early, then guessed, correctly from my clothes, that I was heading out of town to camp. I just laughed and told her, yep, going out to the sticks to commune with Mother Nature. She smiled, wished me a good trip, and I was off driving out to the site. The site was a fully built up campsite. It had space cleared for tents and fire pits, as well as communal bathrooms with showers built in for campers who didn't want to smell like an old foot. We'd spend our days hiking about 85 miles of good trail. Leaves were beginning to turn, and while we were not the only group at the site, the summer crowds were definitely gone. This left us alone, in just our group of nine on the trails. We only saw other people at night when we'd convened to heat up chow on camp stoves and in passing to the bathrooms. I noted the busy times for the showers and began going at nine o'clock at night. By nine, it was mostly cleared out, and I could take my time getting ready, instead of hustling for someone waiting to use my shower next. It was on the third night of our week-long trip that I began to feel 
Weird. Our shop staff had hiked out on a particularly flat trail. The ease of it had made me feel calmer than the rocky cliffs we attacked on days one and two. We made it back to the site around 6 p.m., and as I unzipped my tent, I got that feeling. You know that feeling. As I unzipped my loner tent, I had the sense I just missed someone in it. I paused, mentally inventorying the contents. Nothing was missing, but I just had that feeling that it was disturbed somehow. Strange. I thought about mentioning it to some of my friends, but they'd already broken out the cooler and had some beers and stronger beverages. I didn't want to spoil their jolly mood. I just stayed near the fire until about a quarter to nine. Then I made my way back to the showers and washed the day's grit and hopefully worries from me. The next day, my boss wanted us to split into smaller groups. There was a set of sweat wicking camping clothes he wanted one group to try on a particularly challenging rock climb and some waterproof gear perfect for getting up close and personal with one of the many waterfalls dotting the preserve. I picked the waterfall option and was joined by only one other person, my boss's wife, Angela. She wasn't super outdoorsy herself. She had stayed back at the campsite the previous day before. So as we split off from the main group, I thought to ask her if there'd been any visitors to the site the day before. She said a few groups had stopped by, just being neighborly, but she'd not seen anyone approach the tents. Further, she'd only stepped away once, when a small group had asked for her advice on hanging up their bear bag. But she'd only been away for ten minutes max, and had been in view of our site for the most part. With her assurance, I chalked the previous day's weird feeling in my tent to nothing, or just nerves from being off schedule. But that day, as we reached the waterfall, I had another weird feeling. This time, it was the feeling of being watched. As we walked around the falls, letting the mist refresh us and giving the waterproof gear an honest try, the feeling would not pass. I looked at Angela, not wanting to ask her if she felt it. After all, I'd just been implying someone had been in my tent on her watch. I didn't want her to think I had some sort of nervous condition or paranoia. She seemed unaffected by the strange vibe I was feeling, so I used that to calm myself. She's not sensing anything. Stop being dumb thought. But even as we walked away from the waterfall, I just felt like someone's eyes were following me, insistent like an unwanted hand on the small of your back at a dinner party. That feeling of being watched followed the entire way back to our site. We arrived back at the site first before the other group. Since no one had stayed behind, we'd affixed little locks to our tent zippers. Those wouldn't stop someone from just making a hole with a knife in the nylon, but it deterred most opportunists. I wasn't surprised to see that my lock was still in place, and while opening it and stepping into my tent, the feeling of stale air should have been a relief. That sense of being watched surveilled all day. Well, I was neither surprised nor relieved. As the clock rolled to nine that night, I was still on edge, but decided to give that excuse that I was off routine one last try. So I gathered my kit and per my routine, walked over to the bathrooms to shower. Per usual, it was empty. I'd passed some campers on my way, but there were only one to two people along the whole way at most. I guess everyone else had gone to bed early. 
I stepped into the empty bathroom, walked to the farthest shower cubicle, and turned the knobs to start the water and let it heat up as I prepared. I undressed and stepped into the shower stall, pulling the white plastic shower curtain closed behind me. The hot water hit the cold mountain air and the room filled with mist. I had just lathered up my face when I had the sudden sensation, no, of being watched again. My body was so sure of it, my stomach actually cramped, and I felt like I was going to be sick. I thrust my hands into the stream of water and rubbed at my face, trying to clear the soap from my eyes at least. I mostly did, but as I wheeled about to see who was in the room with me, pulling the curtain aside, no one was there. My eyes stung as soap from my forehead trickled in and I turned back to the showerhead's jet to finish the job of rinsing the soap away. Despite having a clear view around the bathroom and having seen no one, that sick stab didn't go away. It persisted, raising goosebumps on my skin in spite of the shower's heat, and it didn't help that the shower was so loud. I took a side step and stood as still as I could outside of its blast, trying to listen to the room. I could hear nothing but the gush of water. It must have only been ten seconds, but I felt like I stood there for years, craning my hearing to either confirm my suspicion of not being alone, or dispel it entirely. And with that feeling of nothing came a new feeling of anger anger at myself. A grown woman, acting like a child, jumping at sounds that weren't even there. I turned back to the shower head and made to step back into the stream of water. I was thinking that, anxiety aside, I really had to figure out if living my life so regimented and routine was somehow damaging me in the long term. Three days off a schedule and I was out here climbing the walls. This couldn't be healthy and it was all in my head. I told myself that as I took a step towards the blast of water. And that's when a sneeze sounded nearby. My heart stalled a beat, then picked up the pace as adrenaline flooded my system, my fear having turned both of its knobs to full blast. My first instinct was to run. I pushed that plan away running when I didn't even know where the person was, what they might be armed with. It just seemed like a surefire way to get myself hurt. Or worse. My brain was racing, not so helpfully producing thoughts of a hooded stranger. A gun. A hunting knife gutting me like the deer it was meant for. Meanwhile, I was armed with a large bottle of soap and a towel. But in its panic, my brain finally coughed up a useful thought, a memory from summer camp years ago. The showers at this camp had also been communal. As the girls had flounced around, preening and giggling, one of the older girls had dipped her towel into the stream of a shower, wetting it. She then twisted it tightly and snapped it into the air, producing a surprisingly loud crack. Soon, the air filled with the rifle shots as we took to it like another camping activity, like making friendship bracelets. Come to Camp Sloan, learn to canoe, tell some ghost stories, and make your ordinary household towel into a rat tail whip. As my thoughts clashed about, what I was thinking was dumb, crazy. What if I missed? I'd literally be naked. My hands were already at work. It was stupid, sure, but no more stupid than just letting whatever this was happen. I twisted the now sopping wet towels tightly, wringing the excess water from it. Then, slowly, I slid the crackly white shower curtain aside and peered out. I knew from the sneeze that whoever was in here with me was close. 
My eyes flitted about the room, from the toilet cubes to the showers opposite. Another moment, and then my heart was bolting up my throat like it wanted to run by escaping my body. My eyes fell upon two big, muddy hiking boots under the divider of the shower next to me. Whoever it was, they were standing in that stall, the stall that no one used because it was broken and didn't work. They were inches from me, not an innocent camper showering. They were standing in a dry stall with no working water in their clothes. This was no mistake. Slowly, I stepped from the shower, leaving it running to give myself as much of the advantage of surprise as I could. I stood myself in front of that shower. I waited. He must have looked under the divider enough to not see my feet, because I saw his hand, a large yet fine hand, clean fingernails and all, snake out around the shower curtain and pull it aside. This was my one shot, the one I had been building momentum for. His face was in view for a split second, his eyes not yet surprised, not yet seeing me. And I reared back and let the rat tail towel whip fly as hard as I could. I snapped it right into one of his eyes. Direct hit. I only got one more glimpse of his face before his hands came up. He yelled out in pain, and I took my towel and just bolted. By the time I hit the door, I'd managed to unwind it and get the important parts of myself covered before I ran like hell, bare feet not feeling the carpet of pebbles and twigs. Not once, all the way back to my sight. My boss and a couple of others were still up, milling about around the fire. When they saw me, all three stood in alarm. By the time I told them what had happened, I knew the creep would be long gone. My boss and another took off anyway, all jacked up on heroism. The last stayed with me, bringing me another towel, sitting with me, and asking me if I'd seen his face. And I had. Eerily, I had seen his face, and something that made my gut tremble. It was a face I had seen before. But as the blood pounding in my ears receded and my hands began to tremble, the adrenaline retreating like tides, I just couldn't place where. My boss and coworker came back. They confirmed that the bathroom was empty. My boss sat on my other side then kept getting back up and sitting again, so anxious to do something, anything about this. He was asking me the same questions. I spilled my guts. I talked about the sense of someone having been in my tent, of being watched, followed. One of the guys grimly shared that, due to my routine nature, it was unlikely to have been a random encounter. By being so predictable, I'd unknowingly helped a creep know exactly when I'd be alone and vulnerable. He didn't say it like it was my fault. He said it more like there are just bad people out there who look to take advantage. But that night, sleeping doubles with Angela, I laid awake and thought about my little routines again. How easy I had made it to predict where I would be alone for them to wait for me, set a trap for me. My mind spun into crazy and crazier fantasies of who saw my daily routines. The paper boy at home, he usually saw me leave my house. He would know when it would be empty. The couple that jogged at the park along my route, they'd see me around 6.10 every morning. They knew when I'd be by, easy to drag me off the trail and into the bushes. And those were just the ones I was aware of. A random passerby on my street could have noticed the lights flicking off in my bedroom at 9.30 on the dot. They'd know when I'd likely sleep through a cat burglary. Hell, anyone who went to the coffee shop more than once could see what kind of coffee drink I liked. They could spike it while it sat at the pickup counter waiting for me to come grab it, since the coffee shop, too, was used to me and always had it ready for... 
and like that, I placed the face. The man in the shower stall looked different. Of course he would. He wasn't wearing his apron, nor his trendy hipster stocking cap pulled over the back part of his hair. But it was him, the barista at the coffee shop, the one on the morning shift. And hadn't I taken the call about this trip in line in front of him? All there, information freely dropped. And for whatever reason, he'd had a mind to pick it up. The next morning, I told the group I recognized the guy and from where. They were shocked and horrified. Many of them patronized the same shop, and a few remembered him. But no one could agree on what to do about it. Angela was stridently for calling the police, but another interjected, asking for what? Obviously he's a massive perv, but all he has to do is lie about being here. My boss said I should call the coffee shop and tell them. He said he'd want to know if someone he worked with was a problem, pointing out that these things never happen in a vacuum. But to that, Angela doubled down on calling the police first. It's a crime. It goes to the police. You can't dump this onto his boss without a police report. Something substantial behind it, she said. What do you expect them to do with just hearsay? And as she put it, that way, that seemed to become the consensus. So when we drove back the next morning, I went to the police to make a report. They didn't laugh me out of the station, but not even having the guy's name didn't exactly set their eyes alight with purpose. I left, steeled myself, and walked to the coffee shop. I knew the longer I put it off, the harder it would be. To the surprise of no one reading, the male barista wasn't there, caught red-handed or red-eyed from how hard I'd snapped him. When I asked to speak to a shift manager and mentioned the guy, she took it as concern or curiosity, because, as it turns out, that barista wouldn't be back. He'd quit that very morning, citing an emergency. With her kind face, taking me for a customer who'd missed him and not prey of his unrevealed dark side. I just couldn't bring myself to tell her otherwise. The thing that kills me to this day is that I had no idea he had any sort of interest or feelings for me in that way. Like, none at all. There was no flirting, no messages scrawled on my cup next to my name. The man was, for lack of a better word, an NPC in my life, and I had assumed I was an NPC in his. But if that was true, then why, when the opportunity arose, did he take it? It's been about three months since this all happened. The police never followed up with me, and I never saw that guy around anywhere. As my routine goes, I've been making some changes. I take alternating ways to work, I've found different shops, and I try to be harder to pin down in general. But some things don't change. I still work at the Outfitter store, and I still live for my double chocolate mochas. But thanks to a new coffee maker on my counter, I don't have to worry about catching the eyes of a person who could get to know me so intimately without my notice. I forget where I read it, but it was maybe a Reddit thread or an article asking people what they thought the scariest horror movie of all time was. As you can imagine, answers varied, but the one that I recall right now was somebody mentioning the movie The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock, a controversial auteur nonetheless. Their justification for what might be taken as an old-fashioned, sort of strange movie with, let's just say, interesting practical effects, was that there was no explanation, none at all. One day, 
the birds woke up and they decided today's the day. And sure, one sparrow, quick work with a tennis racket, but a swarm of hundreds? Good luck surviving that. The movie continues. People are confused, concerned, trying to figure out why the birds decided that humans had to die and to attack us on sight. And then comes the ending of the movie, and it's the least satisfying ending you can imagine. One day they wake up and decide, eh, okay, on to something else. Why did it happen? Why did it end? What can we do to avoid it happening again? We'll never know. And it's that uncertainty that really drives how scary that movie is. And to think they didn't even break out the big guns and bring in a shoebill stork. <laughs> well, if you'd like to share your thoughts on scary movies or scary things in general, social media, email, both in the description. Or you can use the comments, as well as like or subscribe. It's up to you. I'm just delighted that you stopped by. So until next time, stay strange, stay safe, and take care, strangers. <laughs>